Hey, Cole, oh. nice background. It's you again. Jeez. Every time somebody calls me, I'm thinking, uh, should I answer it? <laughs> and I answered you it. Look, you look good with that background. You got your, it's the same shirt I've seen you wear a million times, but at least the, the colorful shirt is against the white of the dune and then your beautiful long flowing flowing stuff. golden hair oh yes oh, locks. hey i got an easy one today i was just uh, communicating with a good friend of ours actually and he was kind enough to let me know a secret hmm. that i had no knowledge about and i think it's going to be very very helpful for both you and i okay sounds like a game changer bring it on it's a game changer it's it's been I have now learned and I've been educated to know that if you're at third stop increments in your ISO, yeah, I am specifically, right? If you go anything beyond a third stop, man, the noise is noticeably different. So you would be much better. Why are you smiling? Okay, what's uh, okay? The joke's over. This is, over. This is the not realize. a joke. This is very oh, serious. Sorry. This is empirical technical knowledge from a scientific type guy who believes in scientific based stuff. And I think that's really good news okay. so that we know what? Hold on here. Okay. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna open up You're my- gonna share your screen? File manager. No, no, I'm just checking the Angel Gabriel. Oh. oh, crap. What happened? It's on a third stop. I'm gonna throw it away. Yeah, it's no Reading good. That you, file. You, it could have been so much better if you just had been at 100 ISO instead of 160. If only I had known. Yes. Well, isn't that just silly? No, I, it would be that better. Is, well, that as image silly be is shooting better. with prime lenses at F11. That is just not going to change anybody's work. And I bet you anything, John, that if we were to put up if I would have shot the Angel Gabriel at ISO 100 or at ISO 125 and put those two prints up, nobody would ever have known the difference. Yeah. yeah. We just had an interesting conversation with Jack Graham and John Peterson, you know, and and I thought the musical corollary to that was pretty cool. I did not know that Keith Jarrett, the brilliant jazz pianist, you know, demanded a specific piano for what would become probably the best known piano piece he's ever done. I think that we were told, what, three million or four million copies of that. And it's like known by all jazz aficionados. But the, the, the rub was the piano that was rolled out onto stage was the rehearsal piano. It was old, beat up, and out of tune so much that he couldn't play in the lower register. Yeah. Hilarious, hilarious. Right? But the reality no. is, it's so, I mean, it's just to me, it's again, it's not the equipment. It was the artist that was making that. The other one that comes immediately to your mind is you're talking about Angel Gabriel. You told Angel Gabriel to hold still for 30 seconds. He's not sharp. You should have thrown that picture away immediately, should have. Cole. Because it's not sharp. But John, it's salvageable now because I think that that new AI program can probably create a new sharp image. I th And I think you'll sell double the prints of Angel Gabriel if he's sharp. Now, John what? asked a question. Why do we focus so much on the technical? Now, look, I always talk, excuse me, microphone. I always talk as though everyone is a fine art photography, a photographer and has the same goal as I do. And I recognize that birders obviously have a different goal. They have a, a more technical goal and product photographers. And there's all sorts of photographers that don't have the emphasis on vision and creativity that I do. Yeah. But still, why do we gravitate towards things that are the difference between one image and another is so infinitesimally small, it would take a micros an electron microscope to see the difference, yet we focus on that, giving the impression that we think the image could have been much better. Well, uh, John Peterson had, I think, a pretty good answer to that because it's tangible, it's measurable. It's, you know, it, we fun. can say, I'll say that again, sorry. It's fun, gear and stuff is fun. Yeah, absolutely. It is fun, but, and it's harder 
to pay attention to the craft and art side of life, right? To the emotional connection and all that stuff takes a little bit. It's it's uncomfortable for many people to think like an artist and and to be in that creative state of flow that we talk and, about. And for 35 years, I really didn't believe I had as a photographer any creative ability. I thought that photography was more of a scientific art. Yeah. So I thought I could compensate by being more technically perfect to compensate for the lack of creative ability. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I talk with a lot of people and they feel the same way. I'm just not creative. And I believe we all are creative. Uh, we lose it, though, as we become adults. Uh, I think Picasso said that every child is born creative. The challenge is to stay creative as an adult. Yeah. And I believe that we all have the ability to be creative, to have a vision and to create from our hearts. And yeah. I think our goal is to help people believe that so they can search that out. Man, you just nailed it. That was exactly what I was going to go to. The My longest standing lecture that I love to do the most Dream, believe, create. That middle word is the one that if I can get people to truly believe that they can be creative, because I tell the story during that lecture that you and I are very much alike. I, for years, I couldn't draw a stick figure. And in my mind, that meant because I didn't, I couldn't do that, there's no way I could be creative. I saw Nancy Rotenberg's brilliant images and I said, there's no way I can never do that. Never, never, never. And that was my adult self saying that. And it was Nancy, bless her heart, that kept saying to me over and over and over again, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can. You just don't believe it. You don't believe it. You don't believe it. You need to believe, believe, believe. I mean, she would drill that into me for three or four years until I finally did believe it. And then creativity started to happen. But that's the stuff we need to focus on, not well, so many a of us, third stop ISO. Yeah. So many of us were raised in homes where we didn't have the luxury of art. And so, and maybe we gravitated towards technical fields. I worked many years in direct response advertising. And it, all direct response advertising is, is a giant Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, measuring minute differences in different ad responses. And we go down that path and that just reinforces we're not creative. Yeah. But there is something, John, I think even more important than believing we can be creative. It starts with a common a concept that you and I are familiar with, desire, a desire to be creative. Yeah. Desire will perhaps lead to believing that you can be creative. And then it's a lot of hard work. It I mean, is. it's not something you wake up one morning and you're creative. Yeah. I started believing it in 2004, and I don't believe I've tapped a fraction of my creative ability. I keep searching for ways to get rid of all of those shackles that I've carried for my whole life so I can really, really break free of my own limitations. Amen. Well, let's wrap up, try to keep this close to five minutes. I'm going to let you finish. So what what's the takeaway that you want people from today's session? What's that old biblical thing, straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel? Yeah. Let's not focus on things that are so relatively unimportant and let's focus on the big things and if you are going to focus on the technical here's my request focus at least as much time and effort on the creative be yeah. balanced amen good job okay. thank you Cole. good discussion Goodbye, we'll see you in a couple of minutes <laughs>